we're first oh yeah so recording okay so first we're going to talk about the units involved with this kind of topic that we're going to talk about today so when we're talking about solutions like acids bases and other salt solutions even like salt water we usually use molarity and the way we calculate molarity is the moles of solute so whatever you're adding into the water so in the example given here would be sodium chloride or table salt over the liters of solution, right? So the total amount of water and sodium chloride mixed together. So for example, in the, so the example given here, 0.5 moles of sodium chloride are dissol is dissolved to make 0 0.05 liters of solution. Can anybody calculate the molarity of the solution? using the formula. You can put it in the chat or 10. Yep, 10 molar molars, right? So the way you'd say that is 10 molars. Um, another example, uh, how many moles of MgCl2 are needed to make 0.67 liters of a 0.25 molar solution, right? So the capital M means molarity. So we, we're given the molarity, we're given the liters. So we just need to find the moles. Let me know when you guys have an answer. So oh, the formula is just the second bullet point, molarity equals moles of solute over liters of solution. And you don't have to raise your hand or anything. You can just unmute yourself and you know shout out the answer. Okay, 0.1675. So the answer would actually be 0.17. Remember, you gotta account for sig figs. So when we're multiplying a two sig fig um, and a two sig fig number, your answer has to also have two significant figures. So the answer would be 0.17 moles of MgCl2. All right. Uh, so wait, excuse me. I don't really understand the first one. Can I go back and look at it again? Oh and yeah, this first one. example? I mean the second one. Oh, the second one. Okay, yeah. so let me annotate and write out all the work. So we have the molarity, right? We're given the molarity right here. So 0 0.25 is equal to, um, we've got the liters. So this is what we're trying to find up here. And we've got the 0 0.67 liters. So this is what we need to find, right? So how would you go about solving that? Do you just like multiply the 0 0.25 with 0 point? Right, exactly. And that's how you're gonna get X and X is the moles of MgCl2. Nice. All right, anybody have any other questions? Are we good? All right, we're gonna move on. So when we measure the acidity of a solution, we use pH. So that's a measurement of the hydrogen ions in water, right? So it's on a scale of zero to 14 and zero up to like seven, that's acidic. Anything below seven is acidic. Anything above seven is basic. And at seven, you are at a neutral pH. If you measure water, you're gonna get a neutral pH. Um, sometimes it can be a bit like, here and there, but usually it's around that seven number, um, which means it's neutral. So when you're looking at pH, um, the way you count sig figs is a bit different than how you would count sig figs for everything else. So for these kinds of sig figs, you would only count the numbers after the decimal point. So for example, a pH of 4.52 only has two sig figs, the five and the two. A pH of 11.534 only has three sig figs, the five, three, and the four. All right, 
How many sig figs does a pH of 8.3 have? One. 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 Yes, one. that is correct. One. one. Good job. One. Yes, it only has one sig fig, so you'd only count the stuff after the decimal point. So, like I said before, the pH is a measurement of the concentration of hydrogen ions, right? So you've got these H plus ions floating around in the water and that's what causes the change in acidity. So using pH, we can actually go back and forth between pH and hydroxide, not hydroxide, hydrogen ion concentration. So the equation you use for calculating the pH from the hydrogen ion concentration is the negative log of the concentration of H plus ions. And the way you go back from pH to hydrogen ion is 10 to the negative pH. So uh, what is then, the log? Um, log is like a, it's like a function on your calculator. You don't really need to know what it means. As long as you have a calculator with the log button, I'll see if I can show you. So do you see how this button just says log? I can't see it. Ah, okay, let me see. I can. Ah. Okay, wait here. Um, it's that one. That one says log. Right. So when I do, let's say like negative log. I don't know. Point two five. Okay. Oh. Okay, let's try that. When I do that, I'm going to get the pH, and the pH is 0.6. So it's a very, very acidic pH. So you can just use the log button on your calculator. You don't really need to know what it means. Um, okay, so pOH is like the opposite of pH, right? So anything below 7 is not acidic with POH, it's basic, um, which means it has a higher concentration of OH minus ions. So these are kind of the equations you need to convert back and forth with pH, POH, um, hydroxide ion, the OH minus is called hydroxide, and then the H plus ions. So let's do a little bit of practice with this, okay? So if a solution has a pH of 5.62, what is the H plus um, ion concentration? So I'm gonna write out the equations real quick. So pH plus pOH equals 14, pH log, Uh, what is the M and the M like in the? Yeah, so this means millimoles. Right, so you know how we learned about like converting between different like metric units? So it's like that, so molars, not moles. So it's a millimolar. So like molarity, and then you have millimolars, which are I think a thousand times smaller. Uh, okay. If you can't like get millimolars, you can just try, you know, just do molarity. It's not a big deal. Okay. Did anyone get an answer? Yeah, someone put something in the chat. Oh, okay, I can't really, okay, let's see. Hmm. 
Can you, oh, can you show us how to calculate? Can you show us how to calculate it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the way you'd calculate the amount of like the molarity, right? So you do 10 to the negative 5.62. You'd use this equation right here. So this equation is 10 to the negative pH. We know the pH is 5.62 and you just raise it to that power like that. And so from that, you're gonna get a really, really small number. So it's like, I do point about 40 times 10 to the negative six. So I think the way you'd calculate the millimoles would be 2.40 times 10 to the negative third because you'd multiply by this by a thousand and that's how you get the millimoles. Um, but it's not a big deal. You guys can keep it in molars because that's probably easier. Um, now let's go with this. That's so it's, small. A, it's a very, very small number. So that means like all the way over here, it's like it has like seven zeros or five zeros, right? And then two, four, oh. Okay, Wait, you so let's try the second problem. You need a calculator for this, right? Yeah, for sure. If you guys want, you can use um, Desmos. It's like an online graphing calculator. So you can use like the scientific calculator if you don't have like a actual calculator with you, you can use that. All right, so the second one, try to figure this one out. You, go, you might have to like switch around between multiple equations. Uh, what does it mean by OH? So OH is like an ion. It's just like an, it's an oxygen and a hyd hydrogen atom that are stuck together and they've like gained an electron. So it's like a, it's like a, it's like a molecule of its own and it kind of floats around in the water. How to calculate the second problem? Um, do we have any answers or guesses or anything like that? Is it the same formula as the first problem? You can use, there's a couple of different ways to solve this actually. So you just have to try to like go back and forth between the equations, right? So you're given the OH minus um, concentration, that's 0 0.0561, right? From there, you can calculate the POH. So that's gonna be the negative log of 0, 0,561, okay. right? And that's gonna get you, let's see. 10 grams, so it's basically minus 10 grams times 0 0.0561. Oh, there's no grams in here. Oh yeah, log. Right, so you're gonna have the log, negative log of 0 0.0561, you're gonna get 1.25, one, right? Yeah. And then that's the pOH, right? But we want the pH. So we use this equation right here, pH plus pOH equals 14. We have the pOH, we have 14. So we go 14 minus the pOH, 1.251. That's 14, that's 12.75. Uh, wait, so... Uh, yeah, that's correct. Can you go over? Oh, it's 749. Yeah. Anyway, seven. uh, yeah, do you want me to go over it? Yeah, I didn't hear like what happened before. Yeah, let me clean this up a bit. So like, the, it says um, OH minus equals to 0 0.0561. Right. Mol molarity? What does that mean? I'm, I'm not really sure what that is. So it's like the concentration of it in water. So if you took one liter of solution, how many moles of OH minus ions would you find in it, right? And that's 0 0.0561 moles of OH minus ions. So we have that concentration. And from that, we can calculate the pOH, which is a measure of 
basicity or like how basic the solution is. And once we calculate the pOH, we can plug it into this formula right here, pH plus pOH equals 14. And then we can get our pH. Yeah, go ahead and speak. Don't worry about it. How did they come up with the formula converting pOH to pH? I'm not sure how they came up with it. Um, I think they just kind of measured a few different things and then saw what kind of scale it came out to. Um, if you want to research like the history behind it, go ahead and do that in your free time. But no. yeah, we don't really have like a history covering. Maybe they, maybe they test both of them and the right. scales and then they came up with this formula and then they test with more other things, a lot of other things. And then this formula become true. Right, exactly. So I don't really know the history, but you know, feel free to like Wikipedia it. Yeah, it's always a good resource. Oh, okay. I still don't really understand. Like, why do you put like negative ten grams and times it with zero point zero? Oh, there's no. There was no grant. I sorry. That's that was my handwriting. Sorry, that was negative log. Okay. Log. Oh. Yeah, so you know the thing that I said earlier, like the the uh, log button on your calculator? Oh, right, uh-huh. So yeah. negative log of the OH minus, right? And that's gonna get your POH. And then Wait, 14. Why did it get POH instead of like other stuff? So the pH is with the H plus ions. Right, so negative log of the H plus ions gets you pH. All right. See? That's like the H plus. And then the pOH is gonna be the hydroxide ions. Oh, okay. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so once you get the pOH, they're asking you for the pH, right? Yeah, so then you'd use 14 minus the pOH is going to get you the pH. All right, okay. I understand it now. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the next slide. So we discussed kind of the basics, well, like the concept of acids and bases, right? Um, like what the pHs mean and you know what scale is acids, what scale is bases, we learned about that. But now we're gonna learn about the actual definitions of acids and bases, right? So there's three different definitions. Um, all of them are applicable, but some of them are more widely used, some of them are less widely used, some of them are more for specific topics. Um, for the most part, we focus on Bronsted-Lowry, the first one, and Arrhenius acids and bases, those two definitions. Lewis acids and bases, those are a bit more complicated, and that has more to do with like electrochemistry, which we're not going to get into. Um, so Bronsted-Lowry, what that says is acids are proton donors, so proton means H plus ions, and bases are proton acceptors. Right, so you've got, let's see. So we've got HCl, which is a very common strong acid. It gives off this H plus ion, leaving the Cl minus ion to the side, and that will make it an acid, right? It gives off a proton. Bases are proton acceptors. So if we look at, let's say, NH3, NH3 can gain a hydrogen ion and become NH4 plus, right? So it gains this thing, adds one to the H and a plus symbol, right? So you've got the positive charge on it. So this would be a Bronsted-Lowry base, NH3. So, you know, gases can be um, acids and bases according to this definition as well. So now let's look at the second definition. Okay, so Arrhenius acids and bases. 
Um, they talk more about the concentration of H plus ions and OH minus ions, which we kind of discussed with the pH and pOH. So acids are going to donate a proton or an H plus ion, right? So again, we can look at HCl, very common strong acid, which gives off H plus ions, thereby increasing the H plus ion concentration. It also leaves behind a Cl minus ion. An example of an Arrhenius base, however, is not the same as Bronsted-Lowry. So NaOH is a very common strong base. Um, NaOH will give off an OH minus ion and then also give off an Na plus ion. So OH minus ions are going to make the solution more basic, whereas H plus ions will make it more acidic. And then we're not gonna discuss Lewis, um, Lewis acids and bases, those are a bit more complicated. Um, it takes a lot more like background chemistry to understand those, but these are the two main acids bases definitions that you should remember. All right, I think um, William's gonna take over from here. Do bases have a lot of uh, OH? Um, yes, so basic solutions will have a lot of OH minus ions in the solution. So yeah. Why though? Um, well, acidity is just like the measurement of, okay, so here, I'll explain this way. So when you have an H plus ion and an OH minus ion, it's gonna turn into water. Right, so you have H, OH, another way to write water. So these two cancel each other out, right? When you have more H plus ions, it's gonna make the solution acidic. So when you have an excess of H plus ions, it's gonna be acidic. And when you have a lot of OH minus ions, you're gonna have less H plus ions making the solution basic. But like, OH still have like H in it, right? Yes, but it's not the same. So you can't think of them as like two separate particles. They're one molecule, right? H plus is one molecule. OH minus is one molecule. You can't really think of them as two separate things. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, kind of. So yeah. like if H is only by itself, it's like plus sign and like OH, they're like minus. Yes. For, yeah, basically just think about it like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, all you need to know is hydroxide ions. So hydroxide is OH minus. That's going to make the solution very basic. H plus ions or protons, it's going to make it very acidic. All right, so yeah, yeah, this is what makes water neutral. So H plus OH minus ions are both in water, right? And when they combine, they make water and that's like perfectly balanced. So you're gonna get a pH of seven. All right, so I think, do you want me to stop screen sharing, William? Oh uh, yeah, when I start, I think it just stops yours anyways. Okay. So, yeah. All right, uh, there yeah. we go. All right, yeah, so this is the next slide. Uh, basically, you've been hearing us talk a lot about uh, like strong acids, strong bases, right? Like we gave the example of HCl is a common strong acid and uh, NaOH was a common strong base. Uh, well, we haven't like really explained what strong means yet, right? So that's what this slide is for. And you can see from the first line that strong, whether it's an acid or a base, it just means that uh, whatever you're talking about, so let's take HCl, for example, it dissociates completely. Uh, so what dissociate means is that it separates into uh, basically two particles or like two species. So for HCl, if we're talking about that one, it's going to be separating into H plus and Cl minus like we saw before. But because this is a strong acid we're talking about, the reaction goes to completion. Uh, so 
I think like day two, we saw that some reactions have just forward facing arrows and other ones have like right and left. This would have only a one way arrow because you want to indicate that the reaction's only going forward or to the right and uh, it's not reversible. Uh, yeah, so just to recap, strong means it's dissociating 100%. So there's your list of the seven strong acids. Uh, really, there's no pattern here. Uh, it's kind of just memorization. Uh, what does make it a little bit easier, though, is that the anions, uh, anion just means negatively charged ion. So the anion that's attached to the H plus and that makes the overall acid neutral here, usually they're like pretty common substances. Like you'll see nitrate a lot, you'll see sulfate a lot, and like chloride, obviously. Uh, the strong bases are a little bit easier to remember because if you remember anything from the solubility rules that we covered, uh, basically the strong bases are the same ones as the hydroxides that are soluble or slightly soluble. So all the group one hydroxides are soluble, right? Because we covered that um, do one way. They don't have to do with activation energy. Um, or I guess for our purposes, they don't. No, because it's not really about energy. It's, it's more about like equilibrium. Actually, it's like 100% about equilibrium, but uh, we're not going to talk about that today. But don't worry about like the, I guess, mechanisms behind it yet. Uh, so like I was saying, uh, anytime you have a group one cation, so that's alkali metals, uh, whatever it's paired up with, it's going to be soluble, right? And then we have the three heavy uh, alkaline earth metals. So that's calcium, strontium, barium at the end. And since those have uh, two plus charges, you need to have two OH minuses attached to them in order to make the overall charge neutral. Uh, so we just covered what strong means in this context. And then if we talk about weak, um, basically, if strong means 100% dissociation, you can kind of guess that weak means not 100%. Uh, usually, it's like not even close to 100%. Like most weak acids and weak bases, uh, if they're in like reasonable concentrations, they only dissociate like 5 to 10%. Uh, yeah, so weak acids and weak bases, there's definitely like not as much of a pattern to follow here. I just listed out a couple common ones. So like if we look at weak acids, that first one, uh, CH3COH, that's acetic acid. Uh, you'll see it written other ways sometimes, uh, like I've mentioned like a lot. But basically that's the most common way you'll see it written. Uh, and HF, which is hydrofluoric acid, uh, you can see that it follows the same naming scheme of hydrochloric acid, right? Uh, and then there's nitrous acid, which has one less oxygen than nitric acid. That's also like part of a naming scheme. And then H3PO4 is phosphoric acid. And HCN is cyanic acid. Uh, wait, no, hydrocyanic acid. Uh, so CN minus is actually cyanide. You've probably heard of that before. And then H2S, it looks like water kind of, except the O is replaced with the S. That's a uh, hydro, I don't know. I'm having a little trouble today. I probably like hydrosulfuric acid or something like that. And then com common weak bases, uh, you'll see that nearly every weak base that you encounter in just like a general chemistry course, because they don't want to make it too hard on you, it's going to have a nitrogen in it somewhere. So the first one is ammonia. You've probably seen that a little bit, NH3. And then the second one is called pyridine. Uh, that one's probably like not as familiar to you, but you can see the N there. So if you see an N and it's not like nitric acid or a nitrous acid, or I guess like hydrocyanic acid, if the H isn't out in front, basically, it's probably a weak base. Uh, so at the bottom, the pictures, uh, they're really just there to help you visualize what I was talking about dissociation earlier. So like if you look at strong acid, you can see HCl is only going to the right. It's making, or basically like if you dump a bunch of HCl into water, you're only going to have H plus and Cl minus in that water. So like 100% split into two. Whereas uh, for weak acids, so that's acetic acid again, uh, when you put some of that in water, you're actually going to have most of the acetic acid stay in its uh, 
original form. So it's going to stay as CH3COOH, but then some of it is going to split off into two and form H plus and the acetate anion. Uh, so before we move on, I just wanted to like cover something really quick. So most of us have heard of dissolving or like all of us have heard of dissolving, but before today, you might not have heard of dissociation. So uh, a lot of people actually think it's like the same thing, but it's like slightly different, right? So dissolution, uh, that's what the process of dissolving is called. Uh, it's what you would think of for like the solubility rules, right? It's when you put like, usually you're thinking of a solid thing, right? You put the solid thing, AKA the solute into water usually. And if you like mix it around and uh, you eventually just like look at it and you can't tell that you put anything in, AKA like the solution is clear. That means that uh, what you put in there was soluble and it dissolved. Uh, and uh, also your solute doesn't necessarily need to be solid. So like here, I said that ethanol uh, can also be a solute. Uh, if you don't know what ethanol is, it's like alcohol basically, like 70-ish percent of your rubbing alcohol is ethanol. Uh, so you can use ethanol and dissolve it in water. And uh, because they're like miscible liquids, uh, if you like stir it around and eventually just like leave it and look at it, you won't notice any like separated liquid layers or anything. It's just going to look like one liquid layer. So basically that's the process of dissolving or dissolution. Dissociation takes it one step further. So in order to dissociate, something has to dissolve first, but after that, it has to split into uh, multiple like subparts, basically. It doesn't necessarily have to be two, but like 99% of the time it's gonna be two. So the example is if we add salt into water, it's not just gonna stay as NaCl. Uh, it's gonna become Na plus and Cl minus. So that's splitting into two different parts. Uh, yeah, that's probably dihydrogen sulfide or something. That's probably what it's called. Yeah, that is the rotten egg smell. Uh, yeah, that answer is right. That's what a carbonic acid is. That's a pretty common weak acid. I just like listed a bunch, so I probably forgot to list that one. And then uh, this is all leading up to basically this slide where we figure out how to find out if an acid or base is weak or strong, but we kind of have to cover this as like a prerequisite knowledge. So uh, you might have heard like conjugates before just in like algebra, I guess. And it's kind of the same concept when it comes to chemistry, uh, just like applied kind of separately from math. So the conjugate acid of a base is simply that base, but with an H plus added on. Uh, so the reason it's called a conjugate acid is because you're adding an H plus, right? And an H plus is like the most basic acid, right? Like it's literally how you define an acid uh, by the concentration of H plus. So that's why this is the conjugate acid. Uh, so let's say that the base we're talking about is NH3, in other words, ammonia. What's the conjugate acid of NH3? Uh, what are we making if we add an H plus onto NH3? NH4 plus. Yeah, nice. You remembered the plus. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, yeah, nice job. Uh, yeah, we just want to make sure that whenever we're, like, doing reactions, not just to, uh, like, we learned how we needed to add coefficients and, like, balance the number of atoms on each side, right? But we also actually need to balance the charge on each side. So that's what we did there by saying NH4 plus. Uh, let me annotate. Yeah, so that would look something like this. Uh, this reaction, like, okay, you know what? I'm going to stop myself there so I don't confuse you guys. But we'll, we'll cover what I was going to say on the next slide. So like, it, it looks a little bit like that because the reaction wouldn't go to completion. And then the conjugate base is like the literal opposite. Uh, you would take the conjugate base of an acid because uh, like, you wouldn't ever need to take the conjugate base of a base, really. But really, it's that acid and you remove the H+. Plus because uh, removing the H plus uh, kind of has the same effect of adding OH minus to a solution, right? You're making something less acidic, AKA more basic. So that's why it's called the conjugate base. So if we're talking about nitric acid here, what's the conjugate base of that? If anybody wants to give it a try. 
N of three minus. Yeah, nice. So, uh, I mean, you can't really do chemical equations with minus signs. So instead of removing an H plus, I'll show adding OH minus, which has the same exact effect. Uh, so this would actually get a completion. So this would form water because you have the OH and the H plus, so those combine, and then you would get free nitrate. Uh, so that's how you can kind of like, I guess, mathematically visualize the concept of conjugate acids and bases. So all of that was kind of leading up to this slide, which is identifying uh, just like based on looking at the chemical formula of something or even like hearing its name, whether it's weak or strong and whether it's an acid or a base. Uh, so strong acids and strong bases, they're literally memorization. Uh, they're on slide nine. Uh, I mean, I don't know. You might remember a couple like NaOH is like the poster child for strong base and HCl, HNO3, H2SO4. Those are like the most common strong acids you'll see. But really the hard, harder part about identifying stuff are the weak acids and weak bases. Uh, so there are kind of two cases of each, how you could like go about identifying them. So for weak acids, uh, if you see an H out in front basically of the chemical formula, uh, even though it could be like placed in the back, like usually chemical formulas sort by alphabetical order of the elements, and then they just have the subscript telling you how many there are, right? But if somebody purposefully moved an H out to the front, even though there's H's in the rest of it, then they're basically trying to tell you that it's an acid. So if you see an H in front of the rest of the chemical formula, and the following elements basically aren't any of these, and these come from the list of strong acids, then it's probably a weak acid. So for example, HNO2. NO2 minus isn't part of my list here, so I can safely assume that this is a weak acid because they move the H out in front for a reason. Uh, same goes with like, I don't know, HClO2. I don't know why I can only think of oxo acids right now. But uh, this second way of identifying is you look for conjugate acids of weak bases. Uh, this is kind of a circular definition because I haven't told you how to identify weak bases yet. So I'm going to go to that first and then come back. So for weak bases, like I said before, if you see not necessarily a bunch of, all you need is at least one N, and then you see like a bunch of H's in the chemical formula, it probably means that they're trying to communicate you, communicate to you that it's a weak base because, uh, you know, the test makers or like the homework makers or whatever, they're not trying to kill you, right? They're trying to give you an easy time. Uh, and if you see a nitrogen and it's not part of like nitric acid or like nitrous acid, if it's not obviously an acid by putting the H in front, it's probably a weak base. Uh, so you can see that example, like I put there again, is pyridine. And then there's also NH3, which is ammonia. Basically, it's going to be all organic compounds. And then another way you can identify a weak base is by seeing if it's a conjugate base of a weak acid. So uh, for example, uh, I just listed a couple of weak acids up here, right? Uh, that's not a reaction error, by the way. I was just pointing to them. So HNO2 is an example weak acid. What's the conjugate base of that? Anybody got an idea? Uh, yeah, I, I think you're on the right track. Yeah, it's NO2 minus, right? Because all we're doing is removing an H or removing an H plus, but you know, the letter that you remove is the H. So say we're treating this like a chem or like subtraction. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't really ever do this, but I just wanted to show the visualization. So you're left with NO2 in terms of your letters and your subscripts, but then you have to like subtract this positive sign. So you end up with a negative sign at the top, right? So that's the conjugate base of this weak acid. And because it is the conjugate base of a weak acid, it's actually a weak base. Uh, and just as a reminder, weak base means it's basic in solution, right? So it's got a pH above seven and that it doesn't dissociate completely. So basically, it's not going to have as strong as an effect as like NaOH, for example. And then 
uh, if we just talk about like NH4 plus being a weak acid, its conjugate base is actually ammonia, which is how you can tell that that's a weak base if you didn't just like have it memorized or something. And we've been talking about the conjugate acids and bases of weak stuff, right? But what about the strong stuff? If we take the conjugate base of a strong acid, like let's talk about HCl for a second, we're left with Cl minus if we subtract an H plus, right? Um, yeah, so what effect on the pH of the solution is this going to have, if any? Oh, oops. So the actual answer to that is that it's not going to have any effect. So if you just have, I guess, like, <laughs> if you kind of try to imagine this, if you just have um, a solution of salt, you have Na plus and Cl minus in there, right? Uh, I'm just going to do like a spoiler and tell you that the Na plus actually doesn't have any effect on the pH of the solution either. Uh, but the Cl minus doesn't either. So you actually just have a pH 7 solution of water if you're at like room temperature. And the reason that Cl minus or any conjugate base of a strong acid doesn't have an effect on the uh, pH of a solution is actually uh, pretty like intuitive if you think about it. So we're talking about strong acids. If HCl is in solution, all of it is going to go to H plus and Cl minus. But if we like reverse engineer the process, say we only have H plus and Cl minus in the solution. It's not going to, I guess like it's not, the Cl minus is not going to react with the H plus to reform HCl. Because as we already established, even if that happens, it's going to go right back to the H plus and Cl minus because HCl is a strong acid. Uh, so basically, Cl minus has no interactions with either H plus or OH minus in solution. So if you're not reacting with either of the two, there's no way you can affect the pH of the solution. So that's why like conjugate bases and acids of strong acids and bases. So like uh, you would have to match the two. They don't have any effect on pH. But if we think about like weak acids, uh, I'll just write this out. H4 plus. If we think about weak acids like NH4 plus, they don't dissociate all the way. So that's why we have that double arrow there. So if we try to reverse engineer the process again, if we start with ammonia and hydrogen ions, they actually, for the most part, are going to recombine to form NH4+. So that's why NH3 is a weak base, because it's stealing H+, H plus from the solution to make NH4+. Plus. And uh, if you look at it the other way, NH4+, plus is a weak acid. Uh, we, won't, we won't really uh, get into this deeply just because uh, it kind of opens a whole new world. But Ka, uh, it's called the acidity constant, but like it's just a lot easier to say Ka, and that's what everybody does. It just describes like how strong an acid really is. So if your Ka is higher, that means the acid that you're talking about dissociates more, so it's closer to 100%. And thus it's more acidic or it's more strong of an acid. And it works the same way for KB, but in the opposite direction. So a higher KB means the base in question dissociates more and it adds more OH minus to the solution. So it's more basic. So higher just means more extreme, uh, no matter if you're talking about acid or base. Uh, usually we think of strong acids as having a Ka of one it's not necessarily like an exact science, but for water, uh, like we only use water as a solvent pretty much in general chemistry, right? For water, it's completely fine to uh, assume that. So basically strong acids have a Ka of one, and then any weak acids are going to have Ka's like 10, 100, 1,000, even like, I don't know, like 10 billion times lower than that. So you can get an idea of like just how different they are in terms of strength. Oops. Okay, so this is just kind of a thinking question. So there are a couple like things you need to put together for this, but there's no math really. So uh, based on their two KAs, and there's the table there for you to look at, 
would a points one or point zero one zero molar solution of nitrous acid or a solution of the same molarity, aka concentration of acetic acid have a lower pH. So basically, there's two things you need to think about here. You need to think about what a higher Ka means, uh, hopefully you remember, and then you need to think about what a lower pH means. Uh, so if anybody wants to, I guess, type the answer that they think first, uh, try to direct message it to me just so you don't spoil it for everybody else. And then if I see like that we're generally heading in the right direction, then I'll give an explanation as to why, you know, like answer X is correct. So remember, higher Ka means what about the acid? Oops, I'll reshare. I just need chat to get working again. Um, it's actually not that one. Uh, I don't think about, you can use the last slide before this one. Uh, think about what lower pH means, right? Because pH is kind of on a counterintuitive scale. Like, okay, yeah, I don't want to give it away. But lower pH means that you're either acidic or basic, and higher pH is obviously the opposite answer. So you need to figure out what a low pH corresponds to, and then figure out which of these two acids is either more acidic or more basic based on their two Ka's. Yeah, nice, Tony. That's the right answer. Oops, I need to check how we're doing on time. 51? Okay, yeah, that's good. Uh, don't pay attention to the fact that I just went on the wrong slide. All right, yeah, I'm going to start explaining now. So... Oh, where's my annotation tool? Come on. Hold on, sorry, I need to get back my controls. Yeah, Veer, that's right. All right, yeah, so I am going to ex explain. So basically, we covered in the previous slide that a higher Ka means that this acid is more acidic than the one we're comparing it to. So if we look at nitrous acid and we look at acetic acid, and uh, I did write it in a different way, but I've been like alluding to the fact that this and this are the same thing for a little bit now. Acetic acid has a lower Ka than nitrous acid. Uh, since they, I mean, first of all, they have different powers of 10. So obviously negative five is a uh, more negative exponent than negative four. So this Ka is bigger. Uh, so nitrous acid, this one has the higher Ka, right? So it's more acidic. So lower pH, if we think about the zero to 14 scale, this stuff is acidic, right? And then we get to seven and then it's basic. So a lower pH is actually more acidic. And we just covered the fact that HNO2 is more acidic. So that would be our answer. All right, and then the next slide is our last. It's just kind of tying what we've done all together. Uh, it's some stoichiometry stuff. I'm not actually sure how much time we'll have. We can try to speed through it though. Uh, so. You can read the problem on your own. Oh yeah, um, hold on. It's acid 23. Can you just like remember that? Sorry, I can't really type in chat right now. All right, so basically here, I think we're going to end class at like 57, 58-ish and I'll get you started on this problem. 
And then you can do it as review and then we'll go over the answer at the beginning of the next class. Oh, thanks for typing it. So the first thing you have to do here is you have to realize like what reaction is happening. So if we're reacting CaOH2 and HCl, what are the two types of things that we're reacting? Like what is CaOH2 and what is HCl? CaOH2 is a base and HCl is an acid. Yeah, nice. So this is gonna be a neutralization reaction. So that means that acid and a base are gonna to react to form a water or not a water since it's not necessarily one water, but water and a salt. So if we write out the equation, because that's the first thing we need to do uh, without balancing it, the states don't really matter in this one. So you can just leave them out. And because these are both strong acids and I mean like strong acid and a strong base, you can just have the one way arrow. Uh, we form H2O. And then the salt in this case is going to be CaCl2. The reason that there's two Cl's here is because uh, this is actually a Cl minus and this is a Ca2 plus. So you can see that you would need two Cl minuses to offset the plus two charge of Ca. And then if we wanna get to balancing this equation, uh, what's the first thing that looks out of place? Like which atom or like which element it does not match across both sides? Chlorine. Yeah, so the easy fix for that is just to multiply this by two, right? And then uh, that actually fixes the imbalance of hydrogen as well, because if we count it up, there's two uh, hydrogen, wait, hold on. No, it doesn't fix it. I need to put a two over here because there were four hydrogens in total on this side, and now there are four on this side as well. And that also fixes the imbalance of oxygens. So that's our balance equation. And from here, basically what you need to do is you need to convert these masses to mole values. So that would involve finding the molar mass of CaOH2 and HCl. And after that, you would do, uh, for example, for HCl, you would do 10 divided by, so 10 grams. Uh, instead of divided by, you can also write it as in like upside down multiplication, I guess. And then, uh, hold on, Cl is 35.45 grams per mole. And then, H is 1.008, so eight, five, four, six, three, and then so 36.46 grams per mole overall. So basically you would uh, do this, the same thing for CaOH2 as well to find out how many moles are in there. And this is going to end up being a limiting reactant problem unless like by some miracle I chose like really accurate numbers and they run out at the same time. But the next step after you find out the moles of both HCl and CaOH2 is to uh, figure out which runs out first. And then you can figure out uh, basically what's left over and how much. And depending on if you have OH minus left over or H plus left over, that's gonna make your solution either acidic or basic. Uh, let me check the time. Um, so like, why are you dividing like 10 grams by like 36.46? Um, basically, it's because I'm dealing with HCl right now. So I was given that I have 10 grams of pure HCl. And then the 36.46 is the molar mass of HCl. So what I did on this left side over here is uh, I just have this memorized because like they're elements that you encounter often. But if you look at your periodic table, for example, this is the number, oh, I kind of wrote over that three, but 35.45, it might have a three on the end, uh, depending on what periodic table you look at, but that's the number under chlorine. So that's the atomic mass of chlorine. And then the 1.008 is the atomic mass of hydrogen. And those are the only two parts of HCl, right? So if you add up those two masses, you get the molar mass of HCl. And uh, the reason we need to convert to moles in the first place is because that's kind of like the universal unit of amount. Because uh, like say I have one gram of, I, I don't know, like salts and one gram of like, I guess, soap. 
like they're not going to react in the same amount because they have different molar masses and basically like one gram does not equal one gram if you're not talking about the same thing yeah so we kind of you uh convert to molar mm -hmm. what do you do next so after you convert to moles i'm oh, sorry i just need to explain this really quickly since we're running out of time uh but i'll review it at the beginning of the next class too what you do is basically uh you know that for every one part of CaOH2 you use, you have to use two times that much HCl just because that's how we wrote the equation out, right? So like, say I end up having one mole of H or CaOH2 and we ha have like 2.5 moles of HCl. These are just like random numbers, by the way. Uh, if this reaction is gonna go to completion, then I need to use one mole of this, but I would use two moles of this at the same time, just because like we have that one to two ratio written out in the equation. So I would use all of the CaOH2 and I would have 0.5 moles HCl left over. And then what you do with that is you would plug it into the pH equation, uh, basically like 0.5 moles HCl because HCl is a strong acid is the same thing as 0.5 moles H plus. I'm also like not doing sig figs right now, by the way. And then you would divide that by uh, 35 milliliters written in liters, because like that's the units of molarity. Sorry if I'm going too quick too. Wait, what? Oh, because oh, okay. yeah, 35 milliliters is the same thing as 0 0.035 liters. And then if you take the negative log of this, this gives you whatever your pH is. So like that's the roadmap. But yeah, sorry we can't like do it for real right now. Here, I'm going to stop sharing and end the recording. Uh, it has hit 